Assalamu alaikum, salam al khair. Good morning, everybody. My name is Abraham Sbeh. I am a neurosurgeon uh, talking to you from the Farah Healthcare Campus here in Amman, Jordan. And uh, the topic for today will be about petroclival meningomas. The theme, as usual, is to try to correlate the clinical picture with the radiology, with the operative findings, with the pathological specimens, try to put them together so that one can make sense of what is what we are dealing with. So I'm going to present this case of petroclival meningioma. Uh, lots of people would be confused, and I was one of them before, about what constitutes a petroclival meningioma. This is petrous bone, which is part of the temporal bone, and this is the clivus. So the lesion has to be between the petrous and the clivus to be called petroclival lesion. And in this case, this is pathology specimen of petroclival meningioma. If one looks at the temporal bone, this is the internal detrimatus where the seventh and eighth nerve goes through. Here is the jugular foramen where the ninth, tenth, eleventh nerve goes through. This is the trigeminal going into the Michael's cave. And then here in this spot is the sixth nerve. So to qualify to call a lesion a petroclival, it has to be medial to the internal detrimatus. So it should not be here or here. It should be medial to the internal detrimatus between here and here. So to to be called petroclival meningioma. So this is another look at it. This is the jugular foramen, glossopharyngeal vagus accessory going through jugular foramen, seven eighth facial vestibular cochlear going through the internal detrimatus, trigeminal nerve going through Michael's cave, and this is the sixth nerve going through the clivus. So the lesion has to be medial to here. So it should be in here, petro clival lesion. On MRI, this is the internal detrimatus, so the lesion should be medial to it. If it is out, it is not a petroclival meningioma. People confuse this, they call it cerebellopontine angle. Anything in the posterior fossa is called cerebellopontine. Cerebellopontine has to be in this spot. So these lesions are not petroclival meningiomas. These are called outer petrous meningiomas. This is petrous bone and they're arising from the outer part of it, outer petrous meningioma. If you go in, more in, but still you have not reached the internal detrimatus, this is still called outer middle petrous bone meningioma. If you are centered over the internal detrimatus, you look like an acoustic in your room, but you are not. You are a meningioma which is centered over the internal detrimatus. This is what is usually referred to as cerebellopontine angle meningioma. Like this one, or like this one. These are the true petroclavian meningiomas. This is the internal detrimatus, and the whole lesion is medial to it. So one has to be careful. In this case, most of the lesion is medial to it, so it's still petroclavian meningioma. Or this one, or this one. And then things go wild, petroclavian meningioma going to the middle fossa, to the cavernous sinus, to the supracellular area, to the orbit. So these lesions can be real complex. Up to 1970, these lesions were con considered inoperable. Nobody would touch them. Nowadays, 85% can have an attempt at a radical excision. Uh, the, uh, the year 1990 to 2000 was called the decade of the brain because of the so much developments that happened in that area. So our case for today is a petroclival meningioma. It's a female, 45 year old from Iraq. And she presented with headaches and dizziness of one year duration. That was some years back. And uh, this was associated with numbness on the right side of her face blurring of vision, unsteady gait, left-sided weakness. And then things progressed. For five months, she had double vision, 
and then her upper eyelid it dropped down, constituting toes of her right upper eyelid. She was kept on steroids for one year. Why? Because she could not come to Jordan. Why? Because she was waiting for visa to enter Jordan. Why? Because she's living in Al Anbar province. She could not go to Baghdad to get the visa. So she was put on steroids for full year, high dose of steroids, which is nonsense. In her past history, medically, she's hypertensive. Surgically, she had two cesarean sections. Her vital signs were normal. Her general examination showed pale looking lady, moon face because of the steroids. And you can see lots of hers, hirsutism, and the steroid rash. General examination also showed umbilical hernia. The last coma scale was 15 over 15. She had cerebellar signs, finger nose testing, and this dehydrocochinesia was impaired, and she could not walk straight. She also showed a right third nerve palsy and the right sixth nerve palsy. This is the right eye. The sixth nerve palsy here, she could not look this way. And she had toes of her right eyelid, she could not look up. So third and sixth nerve pulses. But her pupils were intact. This is her facial nerve, showing it's good. But she had decreased sensation on the trigeminal nerve on the right side. She had left-sided weakness of grade 3 over 5 with increased tone. The same thing in her upper limb. So left-sided weakness, limb weakness. Uh, for, of course, privacy, we could not show her face, but she had a moon face. So this is to show you that she has a moon face, which is due to the steroids. Hemoglobin was 12.3, white PCs were high, and these were because of steroids. Anybody who's put on steroids for a long period of time, and this lady had this steroids for one year, would have this kind of reaction of white PCs. Bleeding profile was okay, blood sugar was high, and again, any patient on steroids for a long period of time would have diabetes exaggerated or diabetes shown. Liver functions, kidney <coughs> functions were okay, except chloride was 114. May I ask Marwan Khouri, would that constitute any problem? No. All right, 114. Marwan is uh, our lab specialist. Images, and I'll go straight for the contrast enhancement lesion, uh, uh, images. You can see this is the lesion. It is in the, between the petrous and the clivus. So this uh, is uh, representing a petroclival meningioma. And you can see it's going to the right cavernous sinus. So this is the only way to catch a sixth nerve and the third nerve in this area. So this is the lesion. Again, it goes down and then goes up, right up. This is the coronal. And you can say that the brain stem is compressed. This is the bezel or artery here. So severe compression of her brain stem. This constitutes a threat to her life. Petroclavial meningiomas can cause death because of the pressure on the brain stem. This is the sagittal, this is the edge of the clivus, this is normal clivus, and this is the tumor. You can see it's compressing the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. MRA shows deviation. You can see basal vertebral being pushed by the lesion on this side and the right side. MRV to see, because we are going in this area, we need to know this is vein of la bay, which is very important for us. Again, this is what I used to always talk to you about, the technician who does not know what he is doing. The lesion is here, and somebody, some ignorant technician will just draw a line in his pen to you know, obscure this area. This is what we need to see. This is the lesion. So compare this with this. Technicians need supervision <coughs> by our radiologists. We do the MRV because we are going here. And here we'll have lots of veins. And veins are as important as the arteries. 
veins are usually forgotten as if they don't exist as if they are not important if you damage a vein it is just like damaging an artery so you will have a venous infarct as well as a, an arterial infarct so you need to know the anatomy well and you need to know the variations well of the superior petrosal vein vein of dandy etc so many papers written about the varieties of the uh, venous drainage in that area also, many papers written about the varieties of the severe petrosal sinus in relation to the trigeminal nerve. Above it, below it, surrounding it. Again, you damage these, you would kill the patient. Uh, again, here we are we're talking about this area, petroclival area, and petroclival area full of nerves here. So we need to know the veins, especially the vein of Labay. What's the differential diagnosis of the lesion that we have seen? We know we are presenting a case of petroclival meningiomas, but what would be the differential diagnosis? Again, this is not just a mental exercise. It is a true pathological clinical uh, sort of exercise. You have to think of this kind of pathology. What could it be? Because the approach is totally different. So this is petroclival meningioma. This is jugular foramen meningioma. This is epidermoid. The three commonest lesions in the cerebellopentine angle lesion are the acoustic neuroma, meningiomas, and epidermoid. So these are different kinds of meningiomas, and these are all my cases. None of them is from outside. So this is facial nerve schwannoma. Rare, but it can happen. Schwannoma of the jugular foramen. This was a vagus nerve schwannoma, one of my cases. A lymphoma. In particular, this case was not mine, but I have several cases of lymphoma, arachnoid cysts, DNIT, dysmoneuroctodermal tumor, epidermoid we have shown, trigeminal schwannoma of different sizes, there are four grades of trigeminal schwannomas, hemangioblastoma, a lipoma, a glomus jugulari tumor, so many things. If you go in for this tumor and you don't know it's a glomus, you would kill the patient and this family would kill you. So it's not just a mental exercise, it is preparing what you are gonna do. Chondroma, chondrosarcoma, uh, endolymphatic sac. Again, would, would one think of endolymphatic sac? Yes, I have five cases through my career of endolymphatic sac tumor presenting as a cerebellovantine angle tumor. Neurosarcoidosis, metastasis, this was metastasis from melanoma, a choroid plexus, papilloma, etc. And somebody would come and say, I would treat this with gamma knife. Uh, it would be a crime against humanity to treat this sarcoidosis with gamma knife. Medalloblastomas going to the uh, laterally, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, ependymoma, cholesterol granuloma, presenting like this again. You want to know exactly what you are going to do with this case before you go in. Aneurysm. If you are not careful enough, you would have very bad surprise. And of course, clavis cordoma, which was mentioned before. So whenever you look at the lesion, you ask yourself, is this a meningioma? You have the differential diagnosis. And then you ask yourself, is this meningioma symptomatic? Because not every meningioma on the MRI needs to be attacked. Is this symptomatic? Mild headache in a critical situation like petroclival meningioma, you have to think twice. I have this case back in 1998. This young lady of 35 came to me with this petroclival meningioma and she had mild trigeminal neuralgia. Slight pain, this was on the left side, slight pain in her trigeminal area. We gave her Tigritol, just one tablet of Tigritol, 200 milligram, and she responded well. So we left her. No change, 2001, 2002. 8, 12, 17. Look at this. Mm -hmm. 20 years, and there has been no change. Because we just wanted to wait, and this is the right thing to do. Did when it calcify or anything? So, sorry? No calcification from no, the tumor? No. Just a simple trigeminal neuralgia, which responded to Tigritur. So we did a few consultations. Ophthalmology, Dr. Brahim. Dr. Brahim Sadat, an ophthalmologist, will tell us about the findings here. Are you sending her? 
كنت نسادي المدرسه يعني كنت صباح الخير so before we go into details when we think about uh, multiple or more than one cranial nerve region we think of many things and the question for us as a neurophemist is where is the region rather than what is the lesion so where is the lesion to start with before i go to anything else i start thinking about something called myasthenia gravis because if we don't think of this we will forget it because we will do mri we will consult the neurosurgeon so we don't think of myasthenia gravis we will uh, forget about it so a very simple test in the clinic is to put eyes on the toes if it goes up this is myasthenia most of the time if it is not we will go for something else so we think of myasthenia we think of the orbital apex we think of the cavernous sinus we think of a massive brain stem or brain stem vicinity lesion so this was uh, a bad tumor uh, compressing of the visual um, uh, apparatus or the visual system the pupils were reactive or equally reactive because it was compressing uh, probably uh, equally the vision is bad in both side visual fields are decreased in sensitivity both uh, of them color vision was affected 1 over 17 fundoscopy showed moderate optic disc swelling uh, bilateral papilledema uh, and there was horizontal more in the uh, horizontal nystagmus more in the left eye my question to dr brahim i did not see a cerebellar involvement why the Should there is there is there because is a, because yes. the cerebellum yeah, finger nerves, finger nerves, finger nerves, this thing, okay. and this diadocal kinesia were affected. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, uh, any other no, that's, slides? That's, that's right. right. That's Thank it. you. Okay, so, so this was a, a compressive and uh, space occupying lesion uh, combined. You. And just to show you, this is how ophthalmologists look at matters. Toes is, he thinks of my saying gravis. Somebody else would say this is diabetic uh, neuropathy of the third nerve. So each one of us think of it from his own side. That was the idea of this meeting, to listen to each other and see what, what do we think about the, the same problem with different eyes. Uh, we asked our cardiologist to see the patient, Dr. Hassan Namas. ECG was normal. She's hypertensive on treatment. Clinical examination normal. She's a low risk for general anesthesia. But he asked that we postpone the surgery for five to seven days because she was having plavix. Another question, how many of our residents would check that the patient is actually not on anticoagulant or any of similar drugs? Aspirin. Aspirin would stop the surgery for me for five to seven days. Plavix, uh, heparin, uh, etc. So you have to ask the patient, do not wait for the patient to tell you. You should go and ask them. <laughs> Dr. Asad, we asked them to see because she also had some right-sided sensory neural hearing uh, deterioration. Due to the lesion, our anesthetist, Dr. Jamal Sharif, uh, said the patient is fit for general anesthesia. Uh, but because we are putting her in the sitting position, there is high risk for air embolus. And uh, with us here today, our anesthetist, Dr. Abu Aisha, where are you? So we've done so many cases of sitting position, and the risk is uh, sitting position, is the sitting position to cause air embolus. So let's have a look at the anatomy of that area that we are going to operate upon. Anterior fossa, middle fossa, posterior fossa, anterior fossa, middle fossa, we have the sphenoid wing. Middle fossa, posterior fossa, we have the petrous bone, the temporal bone, petrous. So we are going to operate on this area. I better know my anatomy there. I always say it and I keep saying it. We should not be graduating residents who do not know the anatomy. It's not just enough to do bare hole for a subdural hematoma. Okay, we'll send you to the desert to treat people there, but you will not be a good in your research. Temporal bone is the key. This is the temporal bone, 10 to 3 meters, etc. So anterior fossa, middle fossa, posterior fossa, the region is here. Anterior fossa, middle fossa, posterior fossa, this is a cadaver. We will be operating here. Brain stem, cerebellum, cavernous sinus. This is the area we are going to operate. The clavus is divided in three parts. We draw a line between the intermediate meters and the line between the jugular foramen. 
This is upper clivus, this is middle clivus, this is lower clivus. And remember there is an angle here between the petrus and the clivus. It's not straight. And within this stretch of very few centimeters, three to four centimeters, you have you have everything. You have the brain stem and then you have the lower coronal nerve, glossopharyngeal vagus accessory, seven eighth nerve, the uh, the uh, abducens nerve, sixth nerve, and this is the trigeminal nerve. And here is the vein of dandy or severe vitrosal vein going to the severe vitrosal sinus. We will be operating here. <coughs> Brainstem has been removed. We are looking at both vertebral, basilar artery, ICA, pica, lower cranial nerves and the jugular foramen. Again, the seventh, eighth trigeminal. And the sixth nerve. Sixth nerve is the longest nerve. It goes up, ascending for a long way. That's why it is the commonest nerve to be stretched, and it is called false uh, neurological uh, sign because it is stretched with anything. Again, will be here in this area. Same picture. You are in a dangerous area. It is full of mines, and if you are not careful, one of those mines will explode in your face and in the patient's face. Not only the arteries, but the veins, the severe betrothal sinus, the inferior betrothal sinus going to jugular foramen. It's very tricky area. This is the back of the clivus, upper clivus, middle clivus, sixth nerve, trigeminal nerve again. We are operating in here. And this area is very important. This is sixth nerve. I have to know the anatomy well. Trigeminal nerve dividing into V3, V2, V1. And this is sixth nerve going through something called the Rellis canal underneath the Gruber's ligament. Again, if I don't know this piece of anatomy, I will damage the patient. Who's Gruber? This is the Gruber ligament that we mentioned, Wenzel Leobard. Gruber described this 1859. 1859, the Arab world was in a major sleep. Primo Dorello, Dorello's canal, again, Italian uh, surgeon, described this canal in 1905. We're still sleeping, the Arabs. The Gruber ligament, underneath it goes the abducent nerve. So, we'll be operating in this very critical area. This is a close-up view, brainstem, petrus bone, we're here. trigeminal ganglion, V3, V2, V1, and here is the sixth nerve. Now, in the Jordan exam board, neurosurgical board exam, I uh, asked this anatomy, and some people say, well, uh, Dr. Sway has asked us a skull base uh, surgery. No, I'm asking anatomy. I'm not asking the candidate to tell me how he would remove the vitroclibal meningioma. But hell, he should know the anatomy in that area, like a general surgeon should know the anatomy of the appendix. So again, vitroclavian meningioma is here. It should be medial to the internal detrimentus. If it is medial, then it will face the trigeminal, it will face the sixth nerve, and it will face the uh, third nerve. We got the consent for the surgery, detailed consent that we keep talking about. Uh, delicate, fine information that we have to discuss with the patient, and we have to mention that it's going to be done in the sitting position. And the signature. This is what we do, sitting position. We are among very few centers around the world. Here in uh, Farah Healthcare Campus, we do the sitting position, and uh, this is unique in anesthesia. But when you master it, as a surgeon and as an anesthetist, it is little easy. Uh, people are just afraid of air embolism, and I say air embolism can happen anytime, even in the supine position. So the patient is sitting, we put a table on top of the head so that the anesthetist can sneak and check his tubes, etc. Now this is the arrangement, sitting for the patient, sitting for me. Uh, this is Dr. Mohamed Jalad, who is now a full-fledged neurosurgeon from Australia. And we put the patient on monitoring, sometimes you can use navigation, 
etc. So it is a, a sophisticated, uh, high uh, tech. Patient is sitting. We will do this called lazy C incision. We'll remove the bone here, and then we'll go in. So I'll show you the video now. Uh, do you have to mention that the patient is sitting, so you are looking at the back of, uh, of her head. This is the right side, this is the left side. You are opening on the right side. <coughs> so this is what appears on when we... This is the retractor taking the cerebellum, the right cerebellum to the midline. We will come across this, which is the facial nerve, and in front of it is the of the tumor. We will go up. We'll see the third nerve. This is the dorsum cilli. This is the third nerve. This is the posterior communicating, and this is the stalk of the pituitary going to the pituitary dorsum cilli. So from the sitting position, you can go right to the dorsum cilli and see all this anatomy. So third nerve, we come. This is the hypothalamus and on the stalk going to the pituitary. This is the trigeminal nerve. This is the facial nerve. The tumor is in between. This is facial nerve. These are the lower cranial nerve. Glossopharyngeal vagus accessory. So you will work between the cranial nerves. And this is the facial nerve, lower cranial nerves. What magnification is this? 12 to 15. Okay, so we'll see, show this on a video. As I said, the patient is sitting. This is the right side, this is midline. Cerebellum has been retracted to this side. And simply, we are walking between cranial nerves. The anatomical knowledge allows you to do this because you know each nerve where it lies. I here kept this uh, part of the video to show you the, that there is a bleeding, but I'm not affected by it because the patient is in sitting position, so the blood just flows down by gravity. I am at the dorsum cilli, and the origin of the tumor is there. So if I manage to separate the tumor from its origin, then I'll cut its blood supply. I just showed you the blood going down. Here's the third nerve. Going to the cavernous sinus. Now I'm going underneath the third nerve. So third nerve and sixth nerve are structures that you will handle them. This is the transgeminal nerve, and underneath is the facial nerve, and this is the uh, ica. Working between this and this. Here is uh, some tissue there, but I know this is the sixth nerve. So this what seems to be nothing is the sixth nerve. But because I know the origin of the tumor, so I can tell where these are tracked. I use the ultrasonic aspirator, I leave it piece by piece. Trigeminal, facial, I work in between. So here you are. Dorsum cellae, anatomy is very clear and preserved. This is sixth nerve, transgeminal nerve going into Michael's cave. Lower cranial nerves going to jugular frame. This is pathology, Dr. Fasa. Uh, this case is interesting. Uh, it has uh, some um, combined features of meningioma. You can see this is the typical meningothelial type pattern, uh, whirling patterns of spindle cells uh, of meningioma with fibrous tissue in between. But this area it has microcystic uh, pattern. Uh, part of the tumor is the microcystic pattern. You can see small, very small cystic areas uh, of meningioma. Uh, some of them are small bl uh, capillary blood vessels, and this is the microcystic pattern. So this was uh, meningioma, meningothelial with microcystic pattern. 
uh, epithelial membrane antigen is positive and always I emphasize very important of the, the positivity is usually membranous and usually is patchy. And this is very helpful to differentiate meningioma from other tumors. This is why maintain uh, epithelial membrane antigen and why maintain are positive in meningioma. In case we have uh, other differentials, we want to confirm it. Uh, key key seven was in this case about two to three percent, and this is within acceptable range of WHA grade one meningioma. So this is the meningioma meningothelial with microcystic uh, pattern. So this is a meningioma grade one benign tumor, and if you remove it completely, like we did, Simpson grade one, the chances of it coming back is five percent. <laughs> but if you go for partial accession, then the chances of recurrence is 100%. We removed it, we kept the patient intact. This is immediate postoperative MRI the very following day. And it shows that we have done a good job. We removed the tumor completely. And this is the patient, this is the incision. So back to the topic. This is just for the guys to wake up. <laughs> Petroclavial meningioma is between January 85 and January 2017. I had the, I would say, the pleasure uh, of uh, operating on 116 patients, which is a huge number, really, simply because I was, I became to be known as one who deals with such uh, lesions, and people would just uh, throw these cases at me, and I would have them with pleasure. Now, as is with any case, not all the patients would keep the follow-up. So 34 patients were lost for follow-up. I would not include them in the study. I have to have a long follow-up. So 82 were kept for follow-up. But with those 82, there are short follow-ups and long follow-ups. I would not put a short follow-ups. I would love to put only the long follow-ups. So 54 had long follow-ups, and these are included in this study. 54 cases each and every one of them because I used to be meticulous about documentation of my cases since I was a neurosurgical resident. I learned how to document my cases. So 54 patients, mostly females, lucky for us males. And uh, the one famous for these petroclavial meningiomas is somebody called Takeshi Kawase. He is from Japan. He's a friend of mine. His wife Miki is a friend of my wife. And uh, Takeshi Kawase, when he describes how he discovered the so-called Kawase approach, there's a surgery called by his name, Kawase approach. Uh, he said, <laughs> I did not plan it. I got lost during surgery, and I did not want to do, so I drilled this one, I found myself in a good uh, position. And it was called Kawase approach since then. So he classified these meningiomas into four types, the upper clivus, the cavernous, the tentorial, and the petalous apex. And each one of them has different relations with the nerves. Look at this one, third nerve here is different from third nerve here, different from third nerve here, different from third nerve here. So by studying the MRI, I would know where and exactly where to find each nerve. So this is the third nerve, for example, sixth nerve. Here is different from here, is different from here, is different from here, and so on and so forth. So this classification was very nice, so I classified my cases accordingly, the 54 cases, the upper clivus 20 cases, and this is example. So it is just lying in the upper part of the clivus. <coughs> upper clivus 20 cases, cavernous type, which is just going from here into the cavernous sinus, it's called cavernous type. I have 15 cases, and the tentorial cases, which is just running across the tentorium, I have 12 cases, and the petrous apex, which is the easiest, 7 cases, easiest and 7 cases, I would wish I have more of these, so petrous apex, 7 cases. The MRI, we studied the MRI of our cases. We found that we have a unilateral uh, tumors, but also we have bilateral tumors. So again, seeing this, I suspected sarcoidosis, but it was negative. So it was a meningioma. Size, it could be small, it could be giant. 
and somebody would have the audacity and the courage which I don't know how they get this audacity courage to stand up in meeting and say I will treat this with gamma knife this is absolute rubbish nobody would accept this yet some people would stand up and say we treat this by hypofractionation it that does not apply yet people would stand up and say that shape could be anything look at this shape we look at the plane of cleavage this is a good one there's a good plane of cleavage this is a bad one there's no plane of cleavage this is extremely bad very hazy border we look at the brainstem is there edema if there is edema of the brainstem this is a bad case high complication rate look at the edema of the brainstem we look at the origin of the clivus. Are we originating from the upper clivus or middle clivus or lower clivus or whole of the clivus? We look at the nodularity. The more nodularity there is, the bad they are. We look at the seed scan. We look at calcification and bone destruction. These are all our cases. Okay. They're all the more irregular. The pathology is definitely more. Yes, the more aggressive and the more difficult and the higher the complication rate. So when I sit with a patient, I would say we'll have 50% chances of complication or 20% chances. I have to be honest about it. 50% and with the patient would ask what kind of a complication, I would say death, hemiplegia, coma, whatever. I have to be honest with the patient about this because he is the one to go through it, not me. And we have to have a good venogram. This is our venograms. And look at this. It's detailed. You can see vein of labe, you can see the cavernous sinus, you can see the severe betrosal sinus, you can see the inferior betrosal sinus. It's just not like another picture. It has to be a detailed picture because we are going here and we need to know exactly the, the situation with, with the veins. As I say, a technician would come and draw the line and he would just obscure the pathology there. Sometimes we go for conventional angiogram, but sometimes we can actually embolize these cases if they are very vascular. Look at this beautiful pictures in our series. We we'll look at the anatomy well, and we may, as I said, go for embolization if the tumor was very vascular. And this is one of the cases where we did the vascularization. This is a tentorial artery coming from the cavernous portion of the cavernous sinus has been uh, embolized to reduce the blood supply before surgery. <coughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Riyad Al-Adham is not here. He did the embolization. Sometimes Dr. Hazel <coughs> Hamoud would do it, sometimes Dr. Adam, but in this case it was Dr. Adam. What was the presentation of my cases? They can present with anything because they are pressing on the brainstem. But the commonest presentation is this. Abducent nerve. So much so, I can tell you this statement. Any young patient, especially females, coming with a sixth nerve palsy, think of petroclavial meningitis. Any young patient coming with decreased hearing, think of an acoustic neuroma. Don't go for wax in the ear and uh, eye drops and LASIK surgery, etc., etc. This is the cause. This is the commonest presentation of the abduction. What would you do for, for the vitroclavial meningioma surgery? Either total or subtotal with radiotherapy. So many approaches for this area. You can come from front, side, posterior. So there is something called anterior betrosal, which is, as I said, Kawase. And now we call it Kawase Triangle, after the name of this uh, Japanese neurosurgeon who discovered this by accident. Posterior betrosal which is opening of the sphermetrosal sinus and go to that angle. Or pre-sigmoid, sigmoid you go pre-sigmoid, sigmoid you go pre, and we have done a few of these cases. There is this uh, video of this uh, pre-sigmoid. It's okay, it's all right, we'll just move. <coughs> Retrosigmoid, it's as usual. This is the uh, workhorse of this uh, kind of lesions. And as I said, we do, we do it in the sitting position, under navigation, and under every sort of uh, follow-up of these cranial nerves, observation. Again, for the sake of time, 
Maybe I'll just show one uh, video. Did you do most of your cases in uh, sitting position? All yes. these cases that you reported? Yes. Yeah. Not all of them, but most of them. The majority. Yeah. yeah. So just to show you that you are working between cranial nerves, facial, trigeminal, lower cranial nerves. This is sixth nerve. Just to show you at the end of surgery, how satisfying it is. You have removed the tumor, you did not give your patient any radiation, and he's intact. No one would give radiation for a patient with his brain stem being compressed, because the radiation would need at least one year to give you a good result. And in this period, patient will be dead. Okay, I'll just move. Uh, endoscopy has a new role, and I uh, keep saying that in endoscopy lies the future of neurosurgery. It's progressing, still so much shortcomings and so much obstacles to be overcome, especially CSF League, but it's coming slowly. I would think within 20, 30 years' time, endoscope will take over. So they can go through the nose into the petrous apex like this. And look at the beautiful views you get with the endoscope. This is basal artery, cerebral artery, cerebral artery, third nerve, beautiful anatomy. The surgical types of my cases, 15 transitional, 12 somatous, 13 fibroids, 12 chordoid, two, th two were pigmented like this, melanocytic. This was a case that was referred to me. We did the surgery, it was melanocytic. In six months time, it flared up like this. It's very, very malignant. Melanoc melanocytic type of petroclavar meningiomas. Did I have morbidity? Of course. Going for these cases surgically, you have to accept some morbidity. Motor weakness, ataxia, infarct, edema, CSF leaks, and new cranial nerve deficits, because you are manipulating the cranial nerves. And the commonest nerve that is affected is, again, the abducent nerve. Gross total resection, 38 out of 54, with recurrence of five cases. Near total resection, 9 out of 54 recurrence in 4 cases, subtotal resection 7 with recurrence of 4. And as I said, we have long follow up. You have to have long follow up to include your cases in a study. Surgical results were good in majority of cases, fair in 10, poor in 4. And I had mortality in 2 cases. These are formidable lesions. Patients can die. This is important to remember. So we have to be careful in what we tell the patients. Would we give radiotherapy? To me, this is a crime of the crimes. To give petroclavar meningioma pressing the brain stem radiation. Not only that radiation can cause cognitive function, visual deterioration, in case of pituitary pan, hypopituitarism, etc., and it can cause a new a neoplasm. I'm not against radiation. I'm against radiation given in the wrong circumstances. Radiation is a good tool. It's adjuvant to treatment. We want it, we will use it, but not in the sense of using it for everything because I'm a mediocre surgeon and I cannot operate on these cases. Mediocre surgeons are in abundance. So, within the period that we did primary surgery for 54, I treated with gamma knife nine cases, and I treated with gamma knife cases that recurred after surgery. So gamma knife or radiation has a place to, to do, but not every case for radiation. This is what I'm against. This is abuse uh, of the facility. 96, 1996, this is me. How much? 22 years younger. Tenor? No, not a fan. <laughs> and more beautiful. The same. Uh, this is the first patient I treated <coughs> coming back from Sweden, Stockholm, where I stayed for six months. I spent six months. I left my family, I left my children, I left my wife, I left my work to learn something in you. And I brought it back. But in there and then, I knew that a fool with a tool is still a fool. This is just a tool. Like a suction, like a microscope, like whatever. You just cannot use it for everything, otherwise you'd be a fool. I will show you some of the cases that I treated. So when I speak about gamma knife, I'm not coming from Mars or another planet. I am here 
in Jordan, and I have used, I was the first to use it, I was the one who did treatment for majority of cases for the MRI. But I have preservation about how it is abused. 2009, Menjoma case, this is my name on the chart of the treatment, this. 73-year-old female patient with atrial fibrillation. This is the, the indication of the MRI. Deep-seated tumor that you cannot operate. How many sessions? One session. One yes, one session. Time. Another case, 76. You know, diabetic, hypertensive, blah, blah, blah. So I treated her with gamma knife. That's my name. So when I speak about gamma knife, I speak from the point of advantage, point of knowledge, point of power. I'm not speaking about it, just dismiss it. And these are the cases I have treated with gamma knife. So gamma knife is good, but please use it for those cases where you cannot operate. And they have come with a new with a new indication, the mediocre surgeons. They would say, patient refuse surgery, and we have to abide by the patient's uh, wish. If you are my patient and you come to me with a petroclavid meningioma like this, and I tell you, listen, I will do surgery for you, but surgery carries risk about 20, 30% of death, hemiplegia, etc., etc. Or I would give you radiation. I would give you in the morning, you are home. In the afternoon, no surgery, no anesthesia. What would you choose? You choose gamma knife. It is the way you present it to the patient. But they don't tell the patient that radiation is going to take two years to achieve. And to keep that brain stem under pressure for two years is a crime. Usually it's portrayed after hrasa kul asha'a. Exactly. After hrasa kul asha'a, fish fi ajraha. So, a radio surgery has its limitation. I would just refer you to Lars Laxell. Lars Laxell is a Swedish neurosurgeon who invented the gamma knife. Back in 68, 70, that he started thinking about it. He said it's a delivery of high dose of radiation. My Eric Doctor is no high dose of radiation. And the whole dose of radiation given in one session. 15 grays or 20 grays in one session. So it's a high dose of radiation given to a small volume of tumor, which is critically deeply situated that you cannot operate upon. Look at this road, road map that Lars Laxell gave us, small tumors that you cannot operate and are away from the optic apparatus. Now we treat seven centimeters tumors. We treat 70 metastases. We treat everything. So it is abuse of the system. So limitations are there, radio surgery is good. But again, I call it radiotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy and not radio surgery, because there is no surgery. Can it cause malignancy? Yes, it can. And these are the cases of malignancy after gamma knife. I collected it from the literature and I added two of my cases. This was sent for publication and the people of the Gamma Knife stopped the publication because they don't want anybody to hear about this. The mechanism being the actual radiation itself. Actual radiation, just radiation. You see, the word radio surgery is, mm -hmm. <laughs> is fancy. Mm -hmm. Radio surgery, there's no surgery in it. Gamma Knife, Gamma which work like a knife, it's nonsense. It's radiation. It's good when it is properly given. One of my cases, and this is my name, uh, this is a treatment date, 97. And uh, this is this female, 17-year-old. This is neurofibromatosis type 2, bilateral acoustic neuroma, bilateral cavernous meningioma, cortical meningioma. So we went for this, which is the largest tumor on the left side, and gave it gamma radiation. She disappeared, came back with this. This is a tumor that developed on the, on the top of this tumor. So giving radiation to this tumor, we give it in isodoses, like this, lines. This tumor actually developed along the lines of the isodose. And this one is a malignant meningioma. Malignant meningioma on top of radiated acoustic neuroma. Histologically proven. Was it a case highly selected for gamma properly selected? Yes, it's, it's NF2 and, and, and uh, exactly the indication were okay. Uh -huh. uh, but here, when she came with this, well, the only way is to go and 
excise it completely and from excision we got the histology as a malignant meningioma. Another case a 15 year old male patient back in 97 this is me so I know about the machinations of uh, gamma knife bilateral acoustic, bilateral cavernous, cortical meningiomas and schonoma of the accessory nerve there so we we'll give this gamma knife again he disappeared and came back with this his meningioma of the cavernous sinus tends to be malignant we excised it and it is malignant so I'm not against gamma radiation I'm against the abuse of the gamma radiation so why did you go for it surgically initially? why did you? this one? Yeah. which one would you go for? this one we went surgically for this because he presented with quadriparesis and then he presented with signal policy here so cavernous, a true cavernous meningiomas you cannot excise surgically okay. that's why it's a good indication for gamma radiation a proton beam, proton stereotactical surgery is used nowadays for this treatment illustrative cases of these petroclavar meningiomas this is before and after surgery 53 year old patient with this tumor it has been removed and followed up. This is the histology. So, all these cases are ours, they are well documented, they are histologically verified. 52 year old male patient with this, female patient, female patient, yes, and this is the post op. Again, this is called upper clivus cavernous type. This is very massive tumor. And this, massive. This case was referred to us, I think, from Iraq for gamma knife. Somebody in Iraq, a neurosurgeon, thought this is good for gamma knife. You know why? Because he cannot operate. So instead of saying, I cannot operate, he would say, go to Jordan for gamma knife. We don't have it here. Of course you can't. There's no brain stem left, so you have to go for surgery. This before and after histology verified. This Sudanese lady. And this, which I described earlier as a very difficult case. Nodular, it is inside the brain. This is a brain stem. It is inside the brain stem. Nodular, brain, edema, everything in it says, don't touch me. And this case was a Jordanian. Uh, from Palestinian origin came to me begging for surgery and I tried actually not to I was clever said this is a difficult case high rate of complication this is one that carries lots of complications so thank you very much I said no we will accept surgery whatever and lots of people interfered and phoned me so I really went to theater and I was shivering knowing that how much difficult that is it was extremely difficult this before surgery and this is after surgery she came up with some weakness in her arm but it was meningioma grade 1 having seen her after surgery I was pleased but during surgery I was petrified and this is two months beautiful no recurrence whatsoever followed her up for five years there's a small thing there which we are keeping an eye it's been another three years and did not change and she's well so we did nothing great one you know there's no chemo there's nothing no nothing. Nah, this is the idea another case for and after surgery another case from Syria with this large tumor before and after surgery and long follow up this patient had surgery at Central Square. Somebody went in there. What did they do? They removed the cerebellum. Because he has no idea. And instead of saying, I can't do this case, he went in, he just removed the cerebellum, and the tumor is the same. Now, he told the patient, we have removed most of the tumor. There's some tumor left, and we'll send you to Jordan for uh, gamma radiation. Isn't this a crime? Of course, this is not... 
case for any radiation, this is a case for surgery. We went in for surgery, although it is a redo, we removed it completely, it's a grade one. So in conclusion, petroclinical meningiomas are formidable lesions to treat. Well, Arabic formidable, يعني نيلة. نيلة متنيلة بنيلة حسب الرأي المصري. Factors that affect the outcome of surgery and recurrence include adherence to the neurovascular structures, bony invasion, multiple fossa involvement, previous surgery, among other factors. It is difficult for medieval lesion to treat. And to me, retrosic mode approach is still, in semi-sitting position, is an excellent approach to deal with the vitroclavian meningiomas. However, I have used other approaches, the petrosal, the pre-sigmoid, the others, because if every case had its own uh, specific uh, needs for surgery. But the uh, um, most important thing is the anatomical knowledge. With this, I finish, and the floor is open for discussion. Please. Uh, morning. Um, just to give the oncology uh, 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 perspective on this, and Dr. Khouri's uh, 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 question is a, is, is a great uh, introduction to that. There's nothing benign about a benign brain lesion, and, and in this case, meningothelial meningioma grade 1, it's quote-unquote a benign lesion. If, if not dealt with properly, uh, would have simply uh, led to the demise of this patient with horrible morbidity, mortality in the interim. And to sum up a very lengthy, complicated, convoluted body of literature, uh, hormonal therapy does not work, chemotherapy does not work, biological therapy does not work, immunological therapy does not work. Um, well, and and I read the other day, asked you about hormonal treatment for meningioma. Uh, Can the, you comment on this? Uh, the bottom line, it does not work. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data about the role of tamoxifen in, in meningiomas, given the fact that uh, PR, uh, uh, progesterone receptor positivity, etc., and even in the, in the avidly progesterone receptor subsets, bottom line, it does not work. If these patients don't have proper uh, surgical intervention at the get-go, uh, they're really doomed for a miserable course of, uh, of recurrence. Now, one thing that I'm really concerned about is when, they, when these patients get radiotherapy, uh, initially, uh, instead of surgery, because of, of the assumption that they have meningiomas, look at what they potentially can miss. Uh, all of these are, are meningiomas. And is this thing working? I will do. All of these are meningiomas, but this could have been all sorts of different things, including arachnoid stop, uh, DNATs, which would really be uh, sensitive to chemotherapy after the surgery, epidermoids, uh, arachnoid cysts, uh, schwannomas, uh, thank you, oh, that's much better, schwannomas, jugular foramen schwannomas, uh, with Severe different implications to the uh, to the management. Uh, trigeminal schwannomas, lipomas, hemangioblastomas. These are not going to necessarily change the pattern of treatment because the mainstay of all of this is surgical. Uh, however, you can still get sarcoid that would look exactly like this, and this is not even benign malignant. This is not a malignancy, and it can easily be missed, and patients would die because of neurosarcoidosis that would initially improve to radiotherapy, and worse still initially improve to, to, to radiosurgery. Um, uh, ependymomas can present like this, and the implications for that is the chemotherapy choices you're going to use postoperatively. Uh, medial blastomas can have similar presentations, and again, the implications for that is, and for ependymomas, is platinum-based chemotherapy post-operatively and on post-radiotherapy in, in an adjuvant setting. Uh, these have tremendous implications. Now, I cannot emphasize enough the fact that these can be metastases, and 
without really looking carefully in the history and physical in these patients, you're going to miss the primary. And you could have spared this patient a huge surgery had you uh, 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 detected the primary person. Uh, the classic example is, is the lady with a brain lesion who, whose uh, breasts have never been examined and she has brain cancer, uh, breast cancer. And please don't forget that these patients can have lymphomas, and primary CNS lymphomas can present in a periclival pattern in our area, particularly around the clivus. But the implications are tremendous. If these are lymphomas, it's either secondary from lymphoma elsewhere, or primary CNS lymphoma, where had this patient been subjected to radiotherapy initially, this would have improved and the patient would have succumbed to, to her disease that could have been really controlled with high-dose methotrexate for a very long time, even sparing her radiotherapy, not alone surgery. Uh, these are actual cases. These are not hypothetical cases about what could be, what could masquerade as a petrochrival meningioma. These are actual cases that had a very similar clinical and radiological presentation. Any questions, any comments? Please, Dr. Rosario, Samalaj. I want to say thank you for joining us. You are showing us some of your knowledge and your knowledge. I hope if we invite you to a show, I don't think I would like it. Thank you. Thank you. Please. In this bill, plevix, you were talking yes, about yes. us in the mask room. Hello, there's some <coughs> talk about plevix is not really an issue. As I said, the audience, I'm talking about anticoagulants while yeah, drugs I, like aspirin and plevix. Actually, antiplatelet. Uh, yes. Aspirin, Ant sure, I agree sure. with. But plevix, there's a lot of comments nowadays as to whether you really need to stop plevix as far as surgery is concerned. I don't know what your comments are about that, but there's a lot of talk, especially in England. You know, the Europeans say that it's okay to go to surgery even though the patient is on plevix. I don't know what you're, you know, I'm not a surgeon. I just would like your opinion on that. Uh, I am an old dog, and yeah. it's difficult to teach Change. old dog a new yeah. trick. I've been taught all my life that these, these cases better wait for five to seven days. And I know this literature coming up that, you know, it doesn't matter, go ahead. But I would not dare Only for plevix, I not know. so much yes. for aspirin. Absolutely. I agree with you for aspirin, but it works in a different, uh, you know, plevix is, a, it's, it's also an antiplatelet, but it's not on a coax too as, sure. as aspirin is. I, I would not dare to do that, especially okay. if there is an elective case. There's no point on going into a dangerous area. It, nothing may not happen, nothing may, uh, nothing can happen, but still I cannot dare to do that, especially in an elective case like metroclavular injury. So I just wait. Maybe the literature is correct, but I cannot dare to do that. Uh, as a hematologist, no, not as an oncologist, I have to emphasize the fact that Plavix Copregrel would impair irreversibly the platelet function, and and you won't you won't get near normal platelet functions before seven to ten days after stopping them. Now it really depends upon why you're giving the Plavix. Is this a patient who had an MI one month earlier? or uh, three weeks earlier and had a stent, et cetera, et cetera, where the indication for plavix is very different than somebody whose uh, uh, coronary intervention was more than six months earlier. So it's a case-by-case -case thing where you weigh the risk of benefits on <coughs> the intervention that has been made. Can I get away with, um, with holding a plavix for, uh, for a while? Usually, in, in elective cases, in cold cases, for somebody whose coronary intervention has been more than six months ago, right. you're quite safe after a lengthy discussion with the neurosurgeon and the cardiologist, which was we routinely do, to actually hold for seven to ten days before. Uh, Sometimes, if you read things urgently, you can actually give a surge of platelets uh, at the time of surgery without actually holding the plavix before or after, right. just to maintain hemostasis at the actual time of the incision. However, I have to emphasize that this is individualized case by case, and these are lengthy okay. discussions between the neurosurgeon, hematologist, and the cardiologist. Right. Yeah. You just wrote for the residents in the hall. Please go and ask the patient about antiplatelets, aspirin, etc. Yeah. Don't wait the patient to volunteer to tell you. Most patients would not. He would say aspirin, it's not a drug, it's this, he would not even think about it. 
I just tell you about this one case I knew about. A neurosurgeon, a friend of mine, had a carpal tunnel. Simple carpal tunnel. He went to a colleague, a neurosurgeon, who admitted him, <coughs> and nobody bothered to ask what he's taking. And he ended with a huge hematoma after the carpal tunnel. He was off work for one year. Simple carpal tunnel. Nobody asked about aspirin. So it's very important. Dr. Adnan, do you have views about the Dr. Adnan Yes. Do you have your views about the hormonal treatment of meningioma? What? Well, it is not. I never used it. I know. Easy, but I said last time I read about it that they are trying the hormonal treatment and uh, the thyroidine kinase inhibitors, but uh, this is first uh, phase trial. Sure. So somebody is trying to give hormone treatment. Okay. With no, with no more questions. I thank you. We'll meet. Uh, there is one question, uh, Doctor Atan. Did you have any case of chondrosis before? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I do. I, I had three cases. Case. Yes. Yeah, was pre preoperative or not preoperative? Preoperative. I knew what it was. Uh, thank you. We'll meet next Wednesday. Thank you. Okay.